on. Thanks so much for just heard the recording message. Sorry. Uh, put me off. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Liana. I'm a research practitioner and I work in what's actually the newly christened Digital Cancer Research Team. We've uh, moved on from our digital ECMT past. So um, I guess I'm launching our new name to you guys today, our new team name. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about, uh, as Sabine mentioned a little bit, inclusivity in technology clinical trials. So I'm going to talk about how we've tried to address these issues of equality, diversity and inclusion in our work and, and also include a bit of a working example as well to sort of set it to context. So I think it's um, really useful first to just give a bit of background uh, to the inclusivity work that we did before we move on to the specific example and just talk a little bit about the sort of existing issues in clinical research with equality, diversity and inclusion. So I think we will all be aware that the really significant problem of representation in clinical research is something that's really well doc documented in existing literature. And this evidence shows that there's a number of different populations who've long been really significantly underserved in our field. Um, so if we look at the Equality Act, um, it's a piece of UK le legislation from 2010, and it's designed to legally protect people from discrimination, both in the workplace and in wider society. The Act identifies nine different protected characteristics where it's against UK law to discriminate against people on the basis of these. And these are all aspects that are specific to an individual. So these include things like age, race, gender reassignment status and religion or belief, to name a few examples. However, in the UK, there's no current specific legal um, or other regulatory requirements that govern whether the participants in clinical research reflect the diversity of the wider population that they represent. So there's a number of common themes that have been identified within the barriers to participation in clinical research for underserved populations. So firstly, you have the barriers that are specific to individuals, which suggests that these protected characteristics that I set, uh, described as set out in the Equality Act are not being protected in this setting. For example, if we look at the le lack of ethnic diversity in clinical research or the skews that can be found in the average age of research participants. But then looking beyond the individual, there's some broader practical considerations as well, which have been found to stand in the way of participation in clinical research, such as the potential costs and travel involved for participants. Also, if we look out again into wider communities, there's a clear lack of understanding of clinical research. And for some, there's a significant stigma attached to that, which in turn understandably, understandably fuels mistrust. And in research design itself, um, eligibility criteria are often not inclusive and the reporting on the nature of the participant population in research is really poor. And there's also a need for research staff training as well to help to identify existing biases and to help improve overall communication methods between researchers and the participants. And you can see here from the diagram, this is a graphic created by um, one of the University of Manchester MRES experimental medicine cancer students in 2022. And I just think it really nicely demonstrates all those different potential barriers um, that underserved populations are facing. So it's in this context that the Digital Cancer Research Team exists and conducts a key element of our work, which is our technology clinical trials. So these trials are designed to develop new technologically enabled healthcare pathways through patient empowerment. But what we really need to understand and appreciate uh, is the growing uh, discussion around the digital divide in healthcare technology, which we did see start to become more prominent during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this may limit access to these modified care pathways and represents an additional barrier to participation alongside all those uh, existing barriers that I just outlined there that's particularly relevant to our digitally focused work. So to start off, I thought it might just be useful to describe what technology clinical trials are um, for, for everybody here today. So when I use the term technology, this covers things like medical devices, software and artificial intelligence methods. And our technology clinical trials look to test these different types of technologies under the same clinical trial conditions as those used to test new drug treatments. So there's lots of different drivers in these trials. Um, they ultimately aim to assist clinical decision making to benefit the patient, which I think is everybody's aim in the end in clinical research, by um, things like changing the design, delivery and interpretation of early clinical trials, uh, developing new care pathways, as I mentioned, uh, changing the role of the patient. This one's really important for us um, through empowerment, and education and engagement. Um, doing some hypothesis testing, proof of concept testing and prototyping of new technology. And ultimately, this all comes together for um, the aim of clinical benefit for patients. So 
in order to address these issues of inclusion that we face in our work in the digital cancer research team, we sought to undertake a project focused on encouraging inclusivity in our technology clinical trials. So a really key aspect of our strategy as a team is to transform the role of the patient in clinical research to that of co-researcher and not just a number in a research study. But if we want to achieve that, we need to make sure this means all patients. So we do currently undertake patient and public involvement and engagement as part of all of our technology clinical trials. However, we're really aware that when we do that, we tend to draw from a limited population of patients who are not really representative of the greater Manchester region that we're based in. And it's really clear that if we intend for patients to become our co-researchers, there is significant work to be done to ensure that, as I said, this means all patients. So with this in mind, the aim of this project was to develop inclusivity guidance for the future development and management of technology clinical trials. And in order to design this project to be as inclusive as possible, we partnered with Vocal, who are a not-for-profit organisation which creates opportunities for people to learn about and have a voice in health research across Greater Manchester. So the project design uh, initially included three in-person workshops. However, that did have to change um, post-COVID. So these were switched to three half-day online workshops using the Zoom platform. These workshops were attended by members of the project team from Vocal and DCR, uh, academic researchers in digital health, including Mustafa and Louise, um, the chair of the ethnic diversity group at the Christie, uh, Shafaz Saeed, and most importantly, five patients and two patient representatives. So the five patients who participated in the project were patients with a diagnosis of cancer who were directly sharing their experiences. And the patient representatives who were involved uh, provide support for patients with a liver cancer diagnosis and consult on inclusivity and research in general. So they were sort of re really key team members for us. So the first stage of the project, when we were sort of initially designing a, a structure for the workshops, uh, involve mapping the process of technology clinical trials. So this enabled our project partners at Vocal to get a sort of really thorough understanding of our trials prior to the workshops taking place. And as I say, it provided a really nice sort of framework to structure uh, each of the three workshops around. So by splitting our trials process into three stages, we were able to really examine it in lots of detail and make it much easier to understand for all the participants in the workshops. And also, I think it's just good to note that just by taking a step back and objectively examining how we conduct our technology clinical trials, and then by discussing this process in detail in the workshops, uh, we were able to identify sort of immediate practical actions that we can take in order to improve inclusivity. So I think it was a really useful exercise for the team members who were part of Digital Cancer Research just to take a moment to reflect and take that step back and look at the, pro the process more objectively. So, for example, stage one, uh, what we called trial design, our fellow workshop participants questioned how we work with patients to develop our initial research questions. So where currently we tend to sort of formulate questions and then take these to patients and members of the public for their feedback. Our workshop discussions really pushed us to make efforts to work with these groups to co-develop potential research questions. So that was one thing that came out really quickly from the workshops was, you know, do you go to these different populations that you're interested in doing this research with and kind of ask them what their interests are and what uh, potential research questions they may have, have considered? So that was a really a great point for us to, to act on straight away. Then if we move on to stage two, so we call this trial development, um, our workshop discussions led us to consider how we currently engage with patients and members of the public when we come to formally develop the structure of our trials. So this identified the immediate need for uh, our team DCR to work to create and build much larger networks across the Greater Manchester region, which we can use to reach out and take ideas to a diverse group of patients, particularly in a range of convenient and comfortable physical venues as well. So maybe less expecting sort of patients and other contributors to come to us. And finally, uh, we had stage three, which is uh, what we call, we call trial management. And um, looking at this stage, our workshop participants challenged us to push back on the other stakeholders involved in the research process, such as sponsors, to work with us in improving inclusivity in our research and to identify patients to join the study team in both the regulatory approval process, for example, by attending research ethics committee meetings and by being part of the active management of the trial as well. So providing input on participant recruitment as part of a, a steering committee. That's something that there's really no real barrier for uh, patients and other representatives to be involved in. So what we ultimately kind of ended up with through doing this piece of work and completing this project um, is 
aside from the immediate practical actions that I've just sort of outlined there is um, sort of common overarching themes that we were able to identify. And these then form the basis of five key principles that we want to use to guide all our work going forwards. And these are designed to sit across the entire process undertaken by the DCR team for all current and future trials. So the additional detail for each of these principles is included in the full inclusivity guidance document, so the full project report that we produced. Um, but the, the five, key, five key principles, I think, are worth sort of highlighting here as they provide the sort of roadmap for the conduct of our trials moving forward. So uh, I think it's worth me kind of going over each of them here. So uh, our first principle is to take deliberate action to identify and address inequalities in research. So we need to really constantly remind ourselves as a team to be more active rather than passive in the process and to consistently challenge how we conduct our research. Uh, the second principle is to be informed by data and evidence. So to examine existing literature, existing research through the lens of inclusivity in everything that we do. Uh, the third principle is to involve and support people from diverse backgrounds and with different needs. So to build, as I've mentioned, really strong networks to support patient and public involvement and engagement uh, in our research and to make sure that they, these kind of networks really represent underserved populations. Our fourth principle is to remove barriers to involvement and participation. So we need to make sure we work really closely with patients, members of the public and their wider communities to understand what is needed to enable them specifically to participate. So getting a much better understanding of those individual barriers. And finally, our fifth principle is to document and share learning. So for us to make sure that we have time to reflect and in record inclusion considerations and document these in order to feedback on and continuously improve our trial design and conduct. So another really key practical outcome of the project, which I'll uh, reference throughout the rest of this presentation as well, is um, the interactive checklist that we developed. And the idea with this is that it's a, a document, but it really it's a tool that's designed to be as simple and as quick to use as possible. It uses a tick box format uh, supported by Space for Comment and Reflection, which questions the user on what steps they've taken to make their research inclusive at every stage of that trial process. So this document is something that we intend to be actively referred to and completed in order to form the basis of a defined involvement engagement strategy for each individual research project. So. We have our principles that are going to guide us going forwards, but the idea is, is that this checklist will be that sort of active tool that's available for researchers throughout the process of developing their work. So just a little bit more uh, on the uh, the interactive checklist uh, before I move on to our working example. Um, I just thought it was uh, worth going into a little bit more detail on how the checklist was st is structured. So if you look back to with the diagram on the left here, the uh, three stages of, uh, of a technology clinical trial that we identified um, as part of the initial design for the project, we've structured the interactive checklist around that. So um, we have three sort of main sections, trial design, trial development and trial management. And uh, for the, each stage of this in the checklist, they are it's broken down into sort of key steps within each of those stages. And attached to those steps are reminders, which are kind of the active questions that researchers should sort of stop and pose to themselves throughout each stage of the research process. Um, as I say, aside from these kind of tick boxes that you can go through and, and either check as completed or not, there is space for sort of comment and reflection as well. So if there's certain things that a researcher wasn't able to achieve, wasn't able to incorporate into their work um, for whatever reason, there is space to kind of comment and reflect on that. And our, our hope is that then that you can sort of use this going forward forward as a strategy for future work and uh, hopefully help to overcome the barriers that may have stopped you from addressing each of those reminders in the first place. So the checklist is designed to sort of complement that entire trials process. So moving on then to a, a working example. Um, the work that we were doing on encouraging inclusivity in technology clinical trials was happening in parallel to the, the development of our most recently opened technology clinical trial. So although we weren't then able to apply all the findings directly to this individual trial, it meant that we were able to take some opportunities to start to apply what we were learning to the development of this particular trial. So before I move on to the sort of specific um, details of the trial itself, I think it'd be useful to kind of set the scene as to how um, this trial came about. So um, physical activity is something that we know uh, in cancer research is something that's really important and it's a factor that direct, directly influences the treatment of patients. So 
um, patients with increased physical activity have shown to have sort of better outcomes overall. And the way that physical activity tends to be measured, particularly in cancer research, is through using something called the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group Performance Status Score. So you can see on the table on the right there a little bit of a summary of how that score is um, kind of given to a patient. Um, the use of this particular scale, the, the zero to five that you can see here, it is a subjective measurement. So this relies on clinicians interpreting the information that's been shared by the patient and then being able to give them an ECOG PS score based on that information. So we know from existing work that having a clearer insight into patient activity levels and the relationship between this and any adverse events that they might experience whilst taking part in cancer research and part of, as part of a clinical trial uh, could really help us to enhance our understanding of the patient experience and potential treatment toxicities as well. So um, it's important to note as well that the ECOG PS score is something that's routinely included in eligibility criteria for clinical trials. So patients can be excluded from trials based on their level of activity, which can be taken in part from this score. So it is a really significant, um, a really significant thing for patients. So aside from sort of physical activity as a broader kind of factor, Fatigue and insomnia in patients with a diagnosis of cancer are, are sort of specific things that can represent really significant symptom burden for patients. So we know that fatigue is the most common symptom experienced by patients with cancer, and it affects more than half of patients at some point during their journey of diagnosis, treatment, and all the way through. Uh, we know that patients with higher activity levels have been shown to have lower levels of hospitalization and to experience less adverse events from all types of cancer treatment across the board. So understanding these kind of significant uh, symptom burdens for patients, um, we know that having access to more data on things like activity levels and sleep patterns could help to really significantly improve patients' overall health, particularly whilst they're taking part in a clinical trial. So it's with these kind of um, broader issues in mind that the APACE trial was developed. So to kind of address this, the uh, DCR team uh, directly developed the APACE trial, um, which, as I've mentioned previously, was um, coming to coming to sort of fruition in parallel to our Encouraging Inclusivity project. So the APACE trial is funded by the CRUK UpSmart Accelerator Award. Uh, the ambition of this program is to digitalise up experimental cancer medicine centres across the UK, Italy and Spain and provide clinical teams with digital tools for real time access to a wealth of patient data, ultimately, hopefully allowing for faster decision making. So the DCR team's role, specific role in the APACE trial was to design and manage a clinical trial of a device. Um, we were working alongside other research sites who are also part of the Accelerate, UpSmart Accelerator program. So because the APACE trial was kind of being born out of this uh, much broader structure, it does mean that there are many aspects of the trial that our team wasn't really able to control, um, which I will discuss as a bit of a challenge throughout this talk. So. What is the APACE trial? Um, the APACE trial, uh, as you can see here, is a feasibility study, which is designed to collect activity and sleep data uh, from patients who have an advanced cancer diagnosis and are newly enrolled in an early phase clinical trial. So the data for APACE is collected over a five to six week period where patients are asked to uh, wear a wearable accelerometer device. Uh, and there's sort of two key time points involved in the trial. So data is captured for a few weeks um, pre-patient uh, taking part in a clinical trial, and then again for a comparable amount of time post the start of trial participation. And at each of these key time points, as well as wearing the device throughout, patients also complete questionnaires which aim to understand physical activity, fatigue, and insomnia levels. And there are eight centres across the UK, Italy, and Spain who are all part of the, the UpSmart Accelerator program, uh, who are research sites and, and teams that work on this trial. So I mentioned that a wearable device is uh, involved in the APACE trial. So the actual device that was selected um, is something called the Gene Active Accelerometer. And this device was initially selected because it had already been extensively validated by one of the trial centers. So uh, this particular center is the Leicester Biomedical Research Center, uh, or BRC. Um, and they develop lots of different in innovative lifestyle interventions, and they focus on things like diet and physical activity, and they help to prevent and treat chronic diseases, so sort of more broadly than cancer, lots of different types of diseases. Um, 
And so their researchers at Leicester, the rest of the researchers at Leicester, who are our collaborators on this study, they've been involved in really large scale assessment of physical activity using these specific accelerometers. And these have involved thousands of patients of different ages and disease states. So there's been really sort of extensive existing work done on this device. And we know there is potential benefit in using these in a population of patients with a cancer diagnosis. So that's really what guided the device selection for this particular trial was the, the extensive amount of work that had been done by Lester already. So something that we were able to kind of push and lead on uh, in digital cancer research was the inclusion of something called Read It To Me. So as I say, this encouraging inclusivity work was happening in parallel to the APACE trial. So I think a lot of the things that we were learning as we went along enabled us to sort of push at different points to be as inclusive as possible in the APACE trial. And Read It To Me was one of those opportunities for us. So what it actually is, is a series of widgets uh, that have been developed to enable individuals to access information in a language that they understand in both written and audio formats. So the way that Read It To Me enables access to this information is through different social media platforms, depending on what the individual user is comfortable with. So there's a range of different applications that the patient is able to use. And it's important to note as well that um, these um, different forms of the widget, depending on which application they use as part of, um, they are ultimately enabled by Microsoft Azure Cognitive Services. So that uh, sort of overarching framework that exists over Read It To Me is compliant with lots of different international security and IT standards. So data protection is, um, is not a concern here. So just to go into a little bit more detail about Read It To Me and how that kind of looks to um, a participant in a clinical trial. Um, so as I mentioned, it, Read It To Me is a widget. So it's something that can plug in to lots of different applications. So you can see here, it can interact with uh, messenger apps, such as Facebook Messenger, uh, WhatsApp, for example. And Read It To Me can present lots of different types of information through plugging into those applications. So you can include text, PDF files, audio files, videos, including YouTube, and surveys as well. So from the participant's perspective, all this content is sort of translated and appears in an application depending on what they've selected according to what they're comfortable with. So access to the information can be restricted. As I, as I mentioned, data protection is kind of well addressed with Read It To Me. So the content itself that's being shared through the particular application that the user selects is not actually stored by the social channel organizations themselves. So WhatsApp, for example, if the patient were to use Read It To Me through that particular application, WhatsApp themselves wouldn't store the information that's that's being used. So, um, yeah, there's not as much concern about sort of who has access to the information. So our aim in uh, digital cancer research, really, in using Read It To Me in the APACE trial was to really widen participation as much as possible to patients whose first language is not the national language. So in our case, it's English, um, patients who are visually impaired or perhaps have low literacy skills. So we've used Read It To Me to translate the participant information sheet, as you can see here, uh, the consent form and some training materials as well. And these have been translated into the sort of top languages for each research site. So as I mentioned, we have sites across the UK, Italy and Spain. So we've worked with each of those teams to understand which languages would be the sort of most useful for Read It To Me to interact with. And the way the patient would actually start the process, as you can see on the image here, is to scan the QR code using um, whichever device they have access to, most likely a smartphone. Uh, and then you can push through to your preferred application from there. And that's how you'll then view all the sort of relevant information for the trial. So it's sort of designed to be as sort of easy to access as possible. So as part of the patient public involvement and engagement process for the APACE trial, we also ran a series of focus groups across the different sites internationally, um, and they looked at a number of different things, including uh, study design, uh, the patient information sheet and other documentation, and the inclusion of applications uh, in the trial, such as Read It To Me, as I mentioned as well. And in DCR, I think we've really consistently prioritized PPIE in our research, but this can sometimes be focused to the early stages of the process. And that is kind of what happened with the PACE. Um, it was kind of more focused on the design initial stages of the trial. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to have control over the PPIE conducted European sites as well because of sort of logistical issues, time differences and, and language barriers as well. So as I mentioned, we did hold a series of focus groups. Um, the first one was a UK based group, as you can see here. And this was made up of participants who were current and former early tr phase trial clinical trial patients. 
And the findings from this focus group did result in changes to the trial design, as you can see here. So one of the pieces of feedback that we got from the participants um, was sort of concern around completing diaries in parallel to all the different um, com treatment commitments and other burdens that patients have um, when they're going through treatment for their cancer diagnosis. And patients were also concerned as well that the accuracy of a maybe a sleep diary that we'd propose to include in a food diary, they could potentially not be as sort of detailed as we would like them to be in the context of all these different things that patients have to think about. So as a result of this particular piece of feedback, we did remove the sleep diaries and the food diaries from the trial design to try and prevent this additional burden to patients. And, and also another aspect of the trial design is the end of trial interview. So as this is a feasibility study, it's sort of really important for us to include an end of trial interview where we can actually get feedback from the patients and then potentially sort of actively improve the trial process as we go along. Um, but participants were a little bit concerned about how that was kind of positioned as an hour long interview. They felt that was quite long, especially considering, as I've said, the other sort of burdens and commitments that patients have. So we kind of made sure that in the information we provide to um, potential trial participants that we're kind of reassuring them that the length of the interview was a sort of absolute maximum time rather than a formal time for the trial. You know, that it would definitely not take any longer than an hour, but it often would be less. So we just made that a lot clearer in the information and made sure that the participants in the focus group knew that we would discuss that with patients. So uh, the second focus group was um, it took place at the Italian site, um, and that was made up of patients, doctors, research nurses, uh, data managers for trials, and some caregivers as well. And we were able to make some direct changes based from based on the feedback from this group as well. So uh, one thing that the the group highlighted was a preference to have an option to complete the trial questionnaires that I mentioned earlier remotely. So um, having electronic versions or maybe being able to answer questions over the phone uh, to reduce the burden of traveling to the actual hospital as a research site. Um, so as a result of these discussions, uh, we've made sure that every site involved in the APACE trial has access to electronic tablets for completion of this version of the questionnaire. And we're also providing paper versions of the questionnaire as well for people who prefer this format and maybe aren't as sort of technologically focused. Um, there was also another piece of feedback from this group again about the end of trial interview. So it was slightly different feedback in this focus group in that the patients and the, the participants in that group, sorry, felt that it should be conducted as part of a scheduled consultation with a, a known member of the patient's medical team. So this is something that we're going to try our best to incorporate going forward into a pace uh, and sort of making sure that the end of trial interview is coordinated alongside scheduled trial visits and is conducted by a member of the participants care team wherever possible. And the final focus group, this was a group discussion held via Zoom and this was another UK based group. Uh, and this group sort of intended to get direct feedback on the patient information sheet for the APACE trial. So uh, the, the focus group really asked the trial team to look again at the content of the patient information sheet. So uh, acronyms were something that were used and um, the participants felt that's something that should be avoided where possible. And if it has to be used, an acronym, it should be clearly explained. Um, they also showed preference in the group for the use of bullet points or a Q&A format uh, to present the information sort of as clearly as possible in sort of shorter, more succinct chunks. Um, and participants also looked at the uh, contact information in the PIS as well around, you know, who in the study team they should get in touch with to, to find out more. And the participants would have uh, really liked us to include uh, response times with that as when they're likely to hear back from a member of the study team. Um, we were able to incorporate all the changes to the content of the PIS um, uh, from the as a result of that feedback, but we weren't able to in include the response time as it really wouldn't be possible to dictate that for each site. Um, it's interesting to note, actually, that it, this wasn't necessarily a, a potential change that was identified as part of this focus group, but um, just worth mentioning that the use of Read It To Me was really welcomed. And there was one participant who was already familiar with the app and they used it to um, aid uh, their dyslexia and to help with that. So that was a really interesting point to note. And the final sort of piece of feedback that we got um, within this focus group was around um, a potential additional component to the study that we originally intended to include, which focused on diet. And the focus group participants felt that this might be intrusive and be a bit too much of a burden for patients to, to complete. And uh, so as a result of that, this became completely optional for participants in the APACE trial. So we made sure that element wasn't sort of mandatory. 
So I think looking back to our inclusivity checklist, I kind of showed a little bit of the content of that earlier. Um, I think this is really useful to show here as it just highlights the challenges of incorporating all the different reminders that you can see on the image on the right into the final stage of the process. So once that kind of design and development has taken place. So as the APACE trial, as I've mentioned, includes research sites across UK and Europe, um, all of these different sites have to adhere to different sponsorship and regulatory approval processes according to that location. So that creates a lot of logistical challenges, um, which does go some way to explain why uh, sort of patient involvement at this stage of the trial process um, was not as easy to achieve for a PACE. Uh, and it's our intention going forward in digital cancer research that we have patient representatives to form part of trial management committees going forward uh, to help inform the conduct of the study and to help with problem solving as well. So ideally, uh, as a sort of future point to note, we would have a patient uh, who was also actively involved in this stage of the process. So may, they may be attending research ethics committees, for example, and then forming part of an ongoing trial management group. So, yeah, I think it's just worth noting that with this being a multinational trial, this sort of final stage of our checklist uh, was, was a little bit more challenging to achieve with a pace. So I think it's probably sort of worth summarising now kind of what things we think looking at a pace in the context of our enc encouraging inclusivity work we can improve on going forwards and then sort of different aspects where we were quite successful as well. So I think looking at um, things that we did do really well. Um, we were able to directly improve the study design of a PACE through involving these patients internationally. But on reflecting on the process of the study, there are sort of opportunities for us to improve going forward as well. And now that we've completed our work on encouraging inclusivity and we're armed with these tools that we've developed as a result, that's something that we can um, really work on going forwards. Um, so yeah, thinking about what we can sort of improve going forward, um, we were obviously operating within the structure of the UpSmart Accelerator Programme, as I mentioned, um, when we were sort of developing the APACE trial. And that didn't mean that we had less individual control as a team over the PPIE process. And we did have less chance to push for diverse uh, inclusion um, in the involvement of patients. Um, but I think going forward with the interactive checklist to offer as a structure, we sort of have this as a sort of tool in our armory then to really push for the inclusion of a diverse group of voices. Um, I think something else we need to sort of think about going forwards is making sure that that patient is a true co-researcher when they're involved in our research and that they're actively engaged throughout the entire process. And I think as well, um, in future, it would be great if we could have more direct involvement in the sort of technology review stage of our technology clinical trials. So as I kind of outlined, um, this device was sort of selected due to lots of previous validation work from another team that were involved in the study. So that did limit things for us a little bit. Um, but I think it could be really great going forward if we could be more directly involved in that process from the beginning. And yeah, just to kind of highlight what we were really successful in, um, we did receive input from patients across international research sites, which is great. And this directly influenced and improved the study design, including the patient documentation. And although, as I mentioned, there were there is a Spanish research site, I think multiple research sites actually involved in the trial, um, we were unable to include any patient and public involvement and engagement for, for Spain as they just didn't have any facilities to do that there. So that's really unfortunate. But, you know, we did get feedback from the two other countries involved in the trial, which is great. And we're also able to really improve our understanding of how we can encourage inclusivity in our research um, by making sure that, you know, we include things like read it to me um, and we make sure that different tools like this are included throughout the process. Um, so that's one thing that we did, I think, by having this encouraging inclusivity work happening alongside a pace, we did make sure that we incorporated different digital tools that we were becoming aware of through the process that did make things more inclusive. So I think that was a, a sort of good plus point as well. So what's kind of next, I guess, in what we're doing with this work going forward? So what we want to do now is uh, obviously spread the publication of the report as far and as wide as possible uh, and to actually consistently use the inclusivity checklist going forward. So we want to make sure that we use this through all of our research in the digital cancer research team uh, from now on and also sort of seed this tool out to other researchers as well, because uh, we want this checklist to be a continually evolving and improving document and tool. We don't want it to sort of sit statically uh, and not sort of develop as things change and as evidence changes as well. So um, that's something that we're hoping to move through going forward. Um, 
And looking at the sort of process of the APACE trial through the lens of the checklist, it does identify lots of opportunities for inclusive PPIE. So I think it does show that having a structure such as the checklist can really help you to pick out lots of points during the research process where you can be more inclusive as you go along. Um, so as you can see here, we want to use the checklist going forward from the beginning of the process. And we want to use this as a prompt as well to help us consider the role of the patient or patient representative as one of co-researcher who's actively involved throughout the research process process. And we do have another separate aim as well to start to build a continually evolving panel of PPIE contributors who are diver as diverse as possible, who will be help to sort of de co-develop and influence all of our technology clinical trials going forwards. Um, so finally, just a few acknowledgements. Um, you can see the na names of all the key team members here who worked on our Encouraging Inclusivity in Technology Clinical Trials pro uh, project, um, particularly as well, just to highlight the patients and the patient representatives as well. So without their contribution, we really wouldn't have the tools that we have now to push for inclusivity in all of our work going forwards. Uh, I've actually included here a QR code that you can scan to access the full project report, which includes the interactive checklist as well. So hopefully you guys will be able to have a look at that and we'd love to hear any feedback. Uh, and finally, thank you so much for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs>